So thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation to come and talk uh, about our project. I should, say, I should say that, as you can see from the program, I'm presenting here also in beha on behalf of my two colleagues, the uh, co-PI in the project, uh, Dr. Corison Fenwick at UCL and Dr. William Wotton at uh, King's College. So it's a really a joint project. And as you, can see, as you, could see, you will see in my presentation, there are several mini projects uh, as a spin-off from the central project that involve other people. Uh, including Morgan. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, one thing I have to say at the beginning is that uh, I'm not going to repeat in the presentation but uh, um, one aspect uh, of the training includes English uh, language teaching. Uh, language is a major issue because especially Libyans uh, have not been exposed to any other language for a long time. They only speak Arabic. So at the moment we are uh, doing, uh, as well as training in archaeology, also training in English and we work with translators to help them to uh, um, <coughs> increase uh, their capability to interact with the international community. So the idea of this project emerged uh, from uh, a work that I started with my colleague Ralf Bochmann at the Deutsche Archaeologische Institut since 2013. Um, we, um, after the uh, revolution in Libya, um, uh, major problems occurred uh, uh, in the territory, especially because uh, the archaeology of Libya have never been recorded. So there is no, at the moment, any catalogue of archaeological sites of Libya and so this was a priority and we started with a series of training courses in GIS and I should say that since 2013 Libyans have been uh, uh, the object of uh, at least 30 training courses uh, and uh, many of them uh, did not have any result because the training courses that uh, last 10 days and then they go back to their countries and they do other things uh, do not seem to have major impact on their um, capability of uh, uh, improve their uh, knowledge. And so this, uh, this project, as you will see, has a very, a very complex uh, structure that obliges them to continue to work in between the different phases of the training on the field and collect their own data so that they can practice uh, their uh, training, uh, their, um, their skills uh, um, independently and then uh, test the results with us. And that's a way we hope is going to create uh, um, technical uh, staff who will be able to train other people. So uh, the major problem we have encountered since uh, uh, 2013, and I should say this project is just started. We started in April 2017, so we have been running the project only for a few uh, months. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, idea, about the project, and the first uh, feed the season we had. So the major problem we had, we have, we are currently having, is uh, the difficult political situations. We constantly change the uh, people we are talking to. Uh, we uh, chairmen are seem to be uh, nominating in different moments. We have several people who um, think or want to control uh, uh, the heritage. And so this is very, very difficult. And we spend a lot of time in diploma diplomacy um, in uh, trying to develop these, uh, uh, this project and run this project. And this is essential because this is a, co this is a cooperative pro project. So we work on the field with them. We can't do without collaborating with them. They have limited access to sites. So there might be sites which are under threat, but they are not accessible because uh, they are, uh, the political situation is too difficult, it's too dangerous for them. So we have to leave these sites out. Um, in many cases, they can't control the distractions of the landscape. So there is a lot of illegal quarrying, uh, illegal construction on archaeological sites, uh, um, destruction of monuments. Uh, and so this is very, very challenging for them. And finally, there is a lot of looting on site, as uh, Bob has already said, and Morgan will go back on this uh, uh, point later. So what are our priorities? We have a number of priorities which are 
uh, to train people who can document and record archaeology on the whole territory of Libya. And we are very keen in working with East and West because we want them to develop a joint system of recording sites. We want to teach, we are teaching them rapid way of recording these sites and effective because they don't have much time. Their archaeology is under threat now. We uh, teach them, we want to teach them uh, the principle of evaluation of the state of monuments and planning conservation. We are not conservators, so we can't tell them how to act on the buildings, but we want them to learn how to evaluate the situation of the buildings and plan what steps are necessary in order to protect these sites. And then we want to develop expertise, local expertise. So we want to train people locally so they can train others and what they can do without us at some point. And we are working in two North African countries. We are working in Libya and Tunisia because it's very important to, for them to finally have a joint, these are two neighboring countries, and we want them to have a joint system of managing, recording, and acting on sites. And in fact, our first uh, activity together has already given results, and they are now planning to, uh, they are currently signing an agreement for uh, uh, Tunisians to go to Libya to be trained on survey technique and uh, uh, the Libyans to go to Tunisia to the site of El Gem to be trained on excavation techniques. So we want to train archaeologists that can record and we don't only want to train archaeologists, we made a lot of, we had a lot of discussion with the Department of Antiquities of Libya on the fact that we wanted to have good people that are keen in working in archaeology and they are independently thinking and capable of carrying out their projects and this is often very difficult to find. Uh, we are using a site in, uh, in Tunisia, the site of Yunka, which is about 40 kilometers south of Sfax, on the coast. The site is massive, has an Islamic fort, and uh, there are three Byzantine churches that were excavated in the 40s by the French missions. And the site is probably a Punic, Roman, Byzantine, and early Islamic site, but has never been excavated. So there is a lot of material and work that can be done there. And we want to, uh, to help them to produce new documentation in different areas in Libya and Tunisia um, to uh, create models that they can then use in other sectors, in other territory, in other parts of their country. So the project lasts two years. Uh, we, are going to, we are going to train at the end over 40 Libyan and Tunisian archaeologists in site recording and monitoring both on the field using the uh, GIS, building recording, including assessing and monitoring the condition, object recording, and on this uh, Morgan Bezik will talk in more detail, and site conservation, presentation, and management. We want them also to think about outreach activities. One way, essential way, to stop looting and destruction of these sites is to make people aware of the importance of these sites. So we have a series of steps. In the first year, we have done already the first uh, uh, field survey in Yunka in 2017, in July. We had, in fact, more than 20 participants. We had 10, uh, 12 Libyans and uh, in to a total of 28 Tunisians that we trained over time. Um, now that the field work, the first field, for field work has, uh, is finished, at the end, we, are, we have agreed with them a, so a series of mini projects that they will do in their own country, applying what they have learned with us. And then uh, we, we, we have selected four trainees from Libya and four from Tunisia that will do more advanced training in January uh, in uh, uh, Tunisia. And they will be training the others in the next field season. So we will support these eight people we have trained in advance, uh, at advanced level to train the others in the next field survey, that uh, field work that will be in July 2018. 
<coughs> so the, the, uh, the group is uh, divided in three. Each of us is doing a different part, is delivering a different part of the project. Uh, as myself and Marco Nebbia, we are doing a field survey, geophysical survey, uh, GIS, and also object recording, as uh, I will tell you later. We want, to, to, we want to teach them how to do field survey and GPS recording sites because it's very essential for them to define buffer zones of sites. Uh, large sites are normally, it's very important to define the extension of these sites so they can be protected from uh, modern uh, construction. And field, work to, uh, field survey is uh, one of the elements they can use uh, to do that. We want them to define chronologies, uh, identify chronologi chronological horizons for sites and buildings so they can record and map different periods of occupation. And we want them to record the state of preservation of archaeological remains uh, and uh, if there are disturbances. As they do field survey, they evaluate the distractions and the activity that have been uh, continuously done. And this is a work they have done, for instance, in Lepkis Machina, identifying uh, last year um, um, uh, la, the extension of the distractions, the red dots uh, are indicating the part of the city of Lepkis Machina which is under threat of destruction, has been uh, destroyed, looted, or uh, also um, a, lo a lot of these uh, destructions are carried out by grazing, uh, illegal grazing in these archaeological sites. Why do we want to do, we, we teach them to do geophysical survey? Because we want them, uh, this helps them to identify the, the buffer zone because they can see the extension of the sites uh, and also identify the presence of uh, um, structures uh, underground. And uh, here are a few examples from a site in uh, uh, Scotland that was, uh, uh, this is not from our fieldwork, but it's an example on what we want them to be able to do, define the presence of uh, buildings and structures underground so they can protect uh, archaeological areas. The UCL team uh, is uh, teaching them how to record rapidly uh, buildings and objects uh, uh, using the photogrammetry and 3D modeling. And this is composed by Dor uh, Corizan Fenick and Guy Joryev. And also they want to, we, we are uh, teaching them how to use drones uh, because drones are a very quick and uh, easy way to record and map buildings. One of the major issues for sites like Lepkis Magna or Cyrene is that they don't have plan of buildings and this will allow them to quickly uh, be able to uh, plan buildings and structures. <coughs> Training in uh, uh, 3D maps by using the, the results of the, of the drones and also the, photo, the more traditional photogrammetry, they will be able to reconstruct sites and in a way to define their presence, their structures. And through photogrammetry so they can uh, create the basic recording that is essential for evaluating the condition of the buildings. So these, uh, the photogrammetry is in fact highly accurate, it's very cheap and rapid, they just need the camera. Uh, they can uh, import, we can import the data into the GIS so they can really build a massive cor uh, corpus of uh, data and link buildings, sites, monuments, objects, all in one big uh, uh, instrument they can use to control and prevent the territory and protect their territory. The group of uh, King's College, which is composed by William Wooten and uh, Hibal Kalaf, is uh, uh, teaching them uh, mainly how to identify or oh, conservation planning, so evaluate the conditions of the building, and this is to create them to create an inventory, uh, assess the condition, and then plan. Uh, implement the maintenance of these buildings through conservations. Um, the fact that they can work together, Tunisia and Libya, they can uh, develop joints, uh, uh, as uh, Roberto was suggesting for his project, they can develop really a network and they, um, they can discuss um, issues and really develop similar way of managing sites in neighboring regions. They can work with stakeholders and engage with them. 
And here is an example of what. So the, 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 the training uh, was, uh, we inclu includes a seminar work in class, but also field work on the field to evaluate the buildings and then discuss the evidence. We had also the contribution of uh, Professor Michel Bonifay uh, from the French Mission in Libya and the University of uh, Aix-en-Provence uh, in uh, Marseille, uh, who did uh, f uh, pottery training uh, with us. And then the HIDAP heritage. This is another aspect of uh, uh, the project that I just go very quickly because uh, Morgan will tell you about. It's basically an app to fast record objects in muse in, uh, on sites and in storerooms to protect them from looting. Basically, to help them to create a database of what they have in storerooms because at the moment they don't have such a database. They don't have this material uh, available. And uh, as Morgan will tell you, there is a lot of looting and um, selling and smuggling through uh, out of the countries of these material. And the, the good thing of this uh, uh, app is that it's bilingual, uh, works on a 3D, uh, uh, creating a 3D model, and then I leave Morgan who will tell you more. <laughs> So the first season, I'm just going briefly uh, through the first seasons, uh, we had it in, uh, at the site of Junca in July 2017. As I said, um, the, um, we had uh, 12 Libyans and 28 Tunisians overall, and we, uh, we did a month of uh, uh, training. We trained them on survey techniques uh, to identify the extension of, uh, uh, the, uh, of a site in different periods of occupation. Uh, GIS uh, uh, work using the data from Junca. Da data pottery analysis and collection for dating uh, purposes. Photogrammetry and geophysics of the fort to study its form and phasing of the Islamic fort. We have assessed the condition of the Islamic fort and made a management plan of the Islamic fort. We have done outreach activities with the local uh, people, with the friends of Yunka and children from schools. And we have uh, recorded uh, the reuse material in the marabout of uh, um, so the, the tomb of the, gray, uh, of the saint near the uh, fort using the heat up uh, uh, that uh, Morgan will tell you about. Field survey, so we used, uh, uh, we were walked in parallel, we collected uh, material, we used the GPIS, GPS uh, to record sites uh, and uh, we then uh, plotted all the data into the GIS uh, and as you can see some of them are still struggling to go straight. But <laughs> Parallel line is sometimes an issue <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but we are working towards this. Uh, and so this is basically the, the fort, which is located here. And then we, we did the coast. We managed uh, to find the end on this side, and then uh, some parts internal uh, of, uh, uh, of the site. GIS, we did a series of lectures where we first uh, did a theory and then we applied and we analyzed the data. They all look very happy. Um, and, uh, and we managed in the end by uh, using the data from the pottery uh, cataloging and the, uh, the, the field work collection, we managed to identify the end of the site, so the so-called buffer zone of the site of Junca, and the end of uh, the site uh, in the inland part of the site, and then the end of the archaeological presence. Uh, we had to concentrate on this part because the site is massive and was impossible to survey everything in only 10 days. And then on this side, instead, uh, we did survey for three kilometers, but we didn't find the end of the site, so this is still uh, ongoing. Photogrammetry, uh, the team from UCL uh, did uh, uh, work uh, in both the site of Junca and of Tina. Uh, they recorded uh, the um, <coughs> the fort, they used uh, the total stations, uh, so that we taught them how to use the total stations, how to fix the points which are essential for photogrammetry. And uh, uh, we did the work, they did the work in particular on the fort, and they created in the end the 3D model of uh, the fort, uh, and this is work that they have done, the Libyans. We were unable to use the drones because for uh, um, 
uh, the use of drones is very difficult uh, because of uh, security and uh, our drones were stopped at the border in, uh, airport, in the airport for a month and then returned back <laughs> to the UK. So we hope next season we will be able to do this. Um, uh, then uh, they did work on the site conservation, presentation and management, so they did work on uh, the evaluation of the fort, of the structure of the fort. Uh, they did uh, um, <coughs> uh, the plan, they did the management plan of uh, uh, the site of the fort. We had several consultants who came uh, to help us in delivering the training. Um, some uh, of them uh, presented, we wanted them to engage, so they were working and they presenting to the, uh, to the others the, the results of their work. And uh, uh, we also, uh, after they did all this work on the site uh, and they evaluated the, manage the issues of uh, management and uh, um, preservation of this monument, we did uh, uh, outreach activities with the local schools and uh, with the friends of the site of Junca that uh, were uh, is actively involved. One of the major issues uh, about the fort is the fort is, uh, has walls which are about three meters high and people walk on top of the, of the walls, so it's very dangerous. So we were trying to uh, promote the idea that this is not something you should be doing. Um, <coughs> And it is the end of our uh, outreach activities. Uh, they were singing uh, local songs. It was very. Uh, we had a lot of fun as well as as well. We worked, I must say, for a month intensively every day of the week. We had never had a break, so it was quite an intensive work. We trained them on geophysics. Uh, the magnetometers were also stopped at the border, but they came out after two weeks, so we were able to do some uh, some work. And uh, they they did in particular work on uh, uh, inside the fort and we identified some structures that are present inside the fort, uh, part of the f only one corner of the fort have been excavated inside. <coughs> Pottery, as I said, uh, Michel uh, did an excellent work supported by two Tunisian colleagues, they really washed catalogued, drew pottery, so they did the full recording of, uh, uh, of the work uh, and uh, they gave us all the chronologies in time for us to insert the data into the GIS. So what are we going to do next? We are going to, they are currently doing mini projects in different parts of Libya and Tunisia, so they have done a survey in Barca in Cyrene to define the buffer zone, in Lepkis Magna to define the buffer zone, in Taruna where there is a massive site that has never been recorded before. Um, and uh, they will come in, uh, um, in November in Italy, the Libyans, and then everyone in January in Tunis, we will process the data from their mini projects. So they will actively learn, they have collected the data, and we will see with them how they process them, so they will be able also to identify if they have done mistakes, where the mistakes are. In the meantime, we are supporting them through manuals that we have translated into Arabic and also video tutorials that are translated into Arabic. And we have dedicated closed groups on Facebook and uh, Skype. So it's an ongoing uh, process. In November, few, five of them will come to Rome. Then in January, we will go again for a month uh, in Tunisia. Again, English language course, data processing on the mini project. And then in uh, uh, July, June, July, again, work. And now I give uh, uh, space to Morgan. So, hello to everyone. I'm French, so I have to apologize for my English, but I'm French, French don't I, I don't care, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so, um, I am a consultant for the Rome University uh, on this uh, mini project, uh, which is EDAP, Heritage and Documentation and Protection. It's an application um, on Android developed by the Rome University. Um, an easy tool to fast, uh, for fast recording of archaeological artifacts on objects, uh, of objects on the site, museums and uh, in the deposits. 
So, as you all know, we are dealing with a global catastrophe, a disaster, someone said before, the increasing of looting of archaeological artifacts. That's why I'm not completely agree with my colleague who said before that there's nothing new with the, uh, the lootings. In fact, there are four uh, new things. The first uh, is the increase of mechanical agriculture, as already said. The second is the increase of urbanization all over the world, but under control of few developed countries. The third is the, the use of metal detectors and satellite images. Sorry. Okay. And satellite images for the looters, which are more and more common, uh, even in Europe, of course. And the fourth is the development of apps and websites to sell easily all categories of objects, including um, usual commercial sites, as eBay, by example, and specialized sites, as uh, auctions.com, by example. So to make this problem harder, even harder, some of the most important countries for archaeology, places of some of the most ancient civilization, experience a period of major conflict. Uh, of course, Syria, Ir Iraq, uh, Yemen, Libya, Afghanistan, or some countries uh, are confronted with destabilization, uh, as uh, by example, Egypt or Sudan. The recent results of the sales on the art market shows perfectly this increasing. The, the amounts of the sales are completely mad. More importantly, uh, a few decades ago, this market was largely dominated, concentrated in UK, USA, and uh, France. Now this uh, market is the new playground for the globalization with the emergent markets, uh, mainly in Asia, uh, in China, by example. In the same time, the lack of leg legislation, national or international, is obvious. How to prove that an archaeological artifact was stolen recently, uh, by example, before the 1970 UNESCO Convention? How do you prove that an artifact, archaeological artifact, by definition underground, was stolen? That's difficult, because we don't have the documents to prove it. So that's the main problem. How to fight this traffic and to protect uh, archaeological sites? In many cases, those countries accumulate war destructions, high criminality, including uh, terrorist groups, uncontrolled urbanization, endemic poverty, and most importantly, many unrecorded artifacts in museums, deposits, and directly on the ground. By absence of correct and systematic inventory. Uh, it's even true for the French, for example, but those countries accumulate everything. So in the course of those last years, last three years, I began a vast academic study on the funerary sculptures uh, of Cyrenaica in eastern Libya. I am studying a thousand year of funerary art and practices between the 6th century BC and the 4th century um, AD, testimony of the dynamism and the particularities of a region, Cyrenaica, controlled by a Greco-Libyan population around its metropolis, Cyrene, colony of Syria Santorini in Greece, also called the Athens of Africa. These fantastic sculptures I show you are largely dominated by two categories. The first, I have to take this. The first are the funerary divinities. It's a uh, bust or half statues in marble, uh, mainly. Uh, famous because half of them are faceless. And that's uh, a very uh, important mystery of archaeology uh, and result for, for now. And the second uh, tradition uh, from the Roman period is the use of the uh, portraits of the defense uh, in the marble bust. All the sculptures were displayed on the facade of one of the thousand monumental tombs uh, still visible around Cyrene. Cyrene have more than 3,000 monumental tombs visible, and that's maybe 10% of the monumental tombs of the antiquity. François Chamou, uh, the creator of the French mission in Libya, told, nowhere else but in Syrian we have, at the same degree, the feeling that humanity is more composed by dead people than living, one, li living ones. The 
specimen series of Siren was 20 times the size of the city itself. It was one of the major necropolis of the antiquity and one of the best preserved uh, until today. So tell me, um, in fact, the, the most important to, to understand is this site is under two main threats. The opportunistic lootings because of the urbanization and the specialized looting by criminal groups uh, because of the demand of the art market. So Sirene and Sirenaica is suffering for those uh, two problems. That's how I could find during the uh, last uh, three years more than 135 sculptures of this type representing 20% of all the sculptures of those categories already known. So one sculpture on five. It's a uh, disaster. And it's also a chance, because uh, how many objects of classical antiquity can we easily identify? It's very difficult, by example, to confront uh, an Aphrodite, a sculpture of Aphrodite made in Tunisia, or made in France, or made in Italy, or made in Lebanon, or made in Egypt, because most of the categories of uh, classical antiquities was exported and created in different, um, different uh, cities. So it's a chance because we can easily identify those sculptures on the art market. But um, for one sculpture, we have to figure how many other categories of artifacts were exported on the art market. For one sculpture, how many vases, how many coins, how many glasses, how many other artifacts. We are seeing, looking at uh, only the top of the iceberg, in fact. So, launched uh, in this uh, um, discourse to, to find the uh, uh, Libyan artifacts, uh, with the aim of recording, studying, and if possible, say or return those pieces to Libya, I am confronted with the law forces and, and authorities to the main problems. The first is the absence of proper inventory of objects already found. I'm not talking about the artifacts underground, I'm talking about the artifacts into the museum. For example, the second is the lack of knowledge of most of the categories um, to identify very easily the provenance of those objects, and more importantly, the velocity of this market. By example, uh, this sculpture here was sold in three years in four different countries. Sometimes it was sold, uh, uh, by example, in Spain, the same week it was sold in England. So it's a market very, very fast, and we have to react fast. And we are archaeologists, so we are not fast at all. <laughs> and that's, that's a problem, because we don't have the same, uh, the same chrono, I, I have to say, uh, as the authorities and as the art market. So that's really the, uh, the big issue uh, on this. And we need, of course, elements to prove the provenance and to prove that it was stolen. So it's a lot to deal with. Uh, sometimes, by example, in the case of this uh, portrait, we have the chance to have documentation. And this portrait was one of the portraits I could uh, have in uh, uh, Israel because it was documented uh, after a stall uh, looting uh, occurred in the Darna Museum near Sirene in 2005. So it was easy to deal with these sculptures, but most of them are completely unknown and recorded. That's why, in fact, uh, EDAPT uh, was developed. It's not a revolution or a magical tool. Uh, it will not record the things that are underground. But it's an easy tool to fast recording objects. Only one uh, page, in fact, uh, when you can add photographs. And in a few minutes, you can record an object. In a day, you can record hundreds of objects by yourself. So it's very easy to use, very simple, pragmatic. It's free, and it's not under private or uh, governmental control. So it can be used by a non-specialist, and that's very important in Libya and in many countries. Can you imagine if you have an army coming to the site, 
you can involve the local population to do this kind of stuff. So it's very important that. So it will include uh, a link, direct link with a database, a database which will, uh, have the, the, the main meaning of this database is to uh, classify the objects, of course, uh, to transform eventually the files, and uh, to use the uh, image recognition for the art market, it's very easy, and uh, in few cases, to when you have uh, many pictures of the same objects, to do a three-dimensional reconstruction. So it's uh, a database which will be uh, we linked directly to uh, the, the head app. So it will furnish elements to prove directly the legal origin of some artifacts, of course, if it is recorded before. It will give information on the local production identifiable for specific territories because we don't know all of them, and it will give elements to the archaeological research and the knowledge itself. We worked uh, during uh, the training um, uh, with colleagues from Libya, both East and West Libya, and with uh, people from Tunisia, both North and South Tunisia. <laughs> so it was very uh, interesting, um, mainly for the translation from classical Arabic, uh, dialectal Arabic from Eastern Libya, dialectal Arabic from Western Libya, dialectal Arabic from Tunisia, and French, Italian, and uh, other languages, of course, as in English. So it, we adapt uh, this app and it's already functional, in fact. Our the constatations are clear. More a category or an artifact is known, more it is difficult to sell on the art market, more there will be verification by, by law forces and archaeologists, less will be the price, of course, because it will be too difficult to sell, less interesting will be the risk for the traffickers, and less uh, will be the temptation for the looting. So, more you document, more you protect the site. Documentation and diffusion are protection. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for a uh, wonderful, wonderful contribution. Uh, siamo, siamo privilegiati a presentarvi il nostro prossimo eminentissimo eh, ospite e lettore, il generale di brigata Gianluigi D'Alfonso, comandante della Guardia di Finanza. Uh, it's not every day that I get the privilege uh, to introduce a distinguished officer of Italy's National Law Enforcement Agency. And it's a very huge pleasure for me to be able to do so. The General, uh, through his office, through his tireless energy, uh, through his distinguished career, has made an invaluable contribution uh, to fighting crime and to uh, the recovery of stolen art and artifacts. His agency is also uh, rather like the British School at Rome, a symbol of the benefits of working internationally uh, and has had notable successes in the recovery of uh, lost and stolen goods. Uh, we are very honoured uh, that you're able to be with us today uh, to add your uh, extremely important voice to today's discussion and to share with us uh, some of the uh, challenges uh, and problems and experience that you face uh, in this line of work. Uh, please join me in extending a very warm welcome uh, to Generale Gianluigi D'Alfonso. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the British School for having invited me to this important meeting. It's a great opportunity to insert the Guardian Finanza commitment in countering illicit economic and financial uh, activity. Obviously, my speech is uh, not about um, archaeological or uh, um, uh, previous uh, stuff that we were talking about, but it's about investigation investigation about uh, financial investment of the big uh, crime organization that uh, we see often involved in even investigation in stolen artworks, stolen uh, paintings, uh, stolen artworks. Uh, I want to begin with uh, briefly 
Uh, presentation of the Guardia di Finanza commitment. Guardia di Finanza is a military police force uh, reporting of directly to the Minister of Economic and Finance with general economic and financial crime fighting co competence. Our institution, our institutional mission is based on the three strategic objectives in relation to countering the evasion and frauds uh, in general, including uh, inspections, criminal police investigation, uh, supervision of the various tax sects, or, and economic control of the territory and to the monitoring of uh, payment circuits or the financial system, and prevention and countering of illegal trafficking of various types of goods. The second objective strategic is, is, is uh, countering about offenses in relation to public spending, including all the intervention in criminal police investigation and all the assessments uh, for preventing and repressing and due collection and embarrassment in relation to local, national and European balance sheet outgoings and loss of revenue of the state. Third uh, strategic objective is uh, uh, unlawful economic and financial activity in general, including investigation against organized crime, financial assessment, uh, prevention uh, activities as uh, uh, anti-mafia regulation, anti-money laundering controls, uh, inspection, follow-up on the suspicion transaction, um, every gen of uh, um, financial and economic investigation. Guardi Finanza is also part of an integrated system of the Italian Armed Forces, who are military, and it contributes to the political and military defense of the border military operation in case of war and military missions abroad. Recently, in 2016, the organization, our organization, was enthused with the responsibility for the Special Division Sea Security and uh, security in relation to euro circulation and other payment means. Uh, and uh, we had even the responsibility for the function of previously carried out by the forest rangers, Guardia Forestale, to counter the illegal trade of protected plants and animals in custom areas, mountain rescue and the supervision of sea waters bordering with protected natural areas. This, these are our general uh, specific task. Uh, with relation of the protection of artistic and archaeological uh, heritage, as we know, Italy uh, has a unique cultural heritage constituted by archaeological sites, uh, architectural and artistic objects, exhibited in museums and uh, on view for the, everyone to admire in areas and uh, excavation squares, buildings and churches. All these established uh, our cities. The, rich, the heritage whose protection is recognized by the Constitution is also constantly the object of aggression for, uh, from criminal organization, uh, attracted by the remarkable economic return of illicit countering, uh, collecting, sorry, and commercial circuits associated with money laundering. For this reason, the Guardia Finance is often employed in a transversal way in the activity for, of repressing crimes against cultural heritage. Such transversality derives, derives from the specific and exclusive competence that uh, characterize our activity in the economic financial police division, which are part of the Guardia di Finanza. In this context, during economic and financial police investigations, the, depart the departments of the Guardia di Finanza have sometimes been able to discover unusual and particular ingenious forms of uh, laundering uh, the proceeds of illegal activity. It has in fact been discovered during investigation of the criminal organization, in particular those that can count on huge wealth, are inclined, are inclined to invest their money, their profits, uh, in purchase of works uh, of art and goods uh, of particular historic and artistic value. Such assets uh, are for the criminal organization a form of uh, laundering uh, the proceeds of extortion offenses, uh, drug traffi trafficking, arms trafficking, and tax evasion committed by the criminal organization. Moreover, they often constitute an obstacle for those who, who investigate, investigate about, often in some to reconstruct the illegal origin 
as these assets are often not the object of this theft, but are regularity purchased through the use of uh, compliant individuals. The definition of uh, element of the action of well finance in those divisions uh, remains the aggression of ordinary crime and the aggression of organized crime through fighting them in their health, which is their economic and financial affairs, through checks and investigations assignment, above all, discovering and seizing illegal assets illegitimately accumulated by the criminal association. As part of this priority operational experience has shown, as previously mentioned, cases of investment or laundering of illicit proceeds in so-called shelter assets, such as diamonds, precious metals, currencies, works of art, and archaeological finds, that guarantee the criminal organization, organization stable value of the assets through time, prestige, and strengthening of the image in criminal circles, as well as a cultural ransom or, and image, image, and above all, great difficulties for these assets to be traced by the investigators. Now let's see some uh, recent activities carried out uh, in crimes against cultural heritage by, from Guardia di Finanza. The Guardia di Finanza commitment to contrast laundry of the proceeds uh, of illegal activity as our Lord, is the last few e in the last few years has concluded some important operations that uh, I'll describe below. In September 2014, the Financial Economic Police of Rome, at the end of a specific investigation, discovered, discovered in, the northern in the northern area of the capital an ancient Etrusk sphinx stolen a long time ago from the Museum of Cerveteri, the work dating back to the 4th century before Christ, while he was hidden among the fields of the Roman countryside, waiting to be transported abroad, abroad to be destined from the clandestine mark, market of works of art. In January 2015, uh, the Guardi Finanza Union of Gaggiolo in Varese, during a custom check, uh, found on board of a van in transit from the Italian Swiss border seven paintings, uh, two prints, uh, a bronze, two prints uh, a bronze statue, and a wooden table, all dating back uh, to ancient times. Among the recovered goods, attention was focused, focused on the painting of the Renaissance, Renaissance period, period, representing San Sebastian, pierced by horror arrows. In fact, subsequent discoveries enabled to us to identify the work in the painting of San Sebastiano con le frecce del Martino, San Sebastian with the arrows of the Martin Drome, ascribed to the circle of Andrea del Sarto, Florence. Um, 14th century, of extraordinary historical and scientific interest, as well as a great economic value. In February 2015, the Guardi Finanza of Pesaro, during investigation, tax crimes and frauds uh, on insurance company, acquired information that uh, allowed them to locate in a cavo, cavo of a Swiss uh, trust firm based in the Lugano, the old painting on canvas, the portrait of Isabella d'Essa attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, who is considered to be one of the greatest living experts of, on the life, the works of the artist. Subsequent, investiga subsequent investigation activity carried out in collaboration with Carabinieri of the Department for the Preservation of Artistic Heritage of Ancona, allowed to seizure of the painting. Just before the conclusion, of advanced sales and negotiations for an amount of uh, about uh, 120 million euros. In June 2015, at the end of a specific economic and financial police investigation, the old painting with the title Sea Landscape with uh, Shepherds and Hearts by the Dutch painter Peter Mew, uh, Moulier, better known as the Cavalier Tempesta, was recovered, stolen by the Nazi troops in Poland from the collection of the National Museum of Wrocław. The painting recovered, recovered at uh, an action house in Milan was lost at the end of the Second World War, so much so that the work was classified as loss of war and, fr and from the moment on began to pass through the living rooms of the German middle class of the time until it reappeared in Switzerland during the 
90s in the collection of wealthy, of a wealthy entrepreneur. From that moment, uh, on the pine passed through several uh, hands uh, until it was intercepted by the financial economic police of Rome, well, the finanza, on the eve of an action that would have put the illegal market. But the most important case of, uh, uh, for its worldwide relevance was the recent discovery by the Guardia Finanza of Naples, I mean, the provincial Guardia Finanza of Naples, in fact, in the September 2016, over the two, famo two famous paintings uh, of Van Gogh, View of the Sea at the Scheveningen and the Congre con Congregation Live at the Reformed Church in Neumann, by the Dutch painter Vincent Van Gogh, of a value of uh, uh, over uh, 50 million euros, which were stolen from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam in December 2002. The operation was, connect to, was connected to an organized crime group investigation that in January 2016 led the arrest of the leaders of a Scampia Sprinter Group Scissionisti. Scampia is a, is a uh, clan, is a group of uh, uh, Camorra. Camorra is uh, the typical uh, Napolitan uh, mafia, different from mafia, Sicilian mafia and Drangheta, that's it's typical of uh, uh, Calabria. Uh, this group, um, uh, this group uh, had invested their money in this, uh, in, the, uh, in this, um, buying these two, uh, uh, two lost uh, and stolen paintings. We already, we even uh, uh, seizure uh, uh, assets for uh, a value of uh, uh, 10 million euros to this group. Now I'm going to elucidate the main aspects of uh, the Van Gogh operation. The two paintings vanished in 2002 after two Dutch thieves climbed a ladder on the roof of a Van Gogh Amster Museum and broke into, into the building in a haste that took only four minutes. They escaped by sliding down a rope. After, the, after that, two years, uh, two, years, uh, two years later, the two thieves were arrested, but the two, the two paintings in the meantime were disappeared. After 14 years uh, from uh, the disappearance, uh, the recovery of uh, these two important paintings is the result of a complex investigation led by Guardia di Finanza under the direction of the Anti-Mafia Prosecution of, uh, Office of Naples against a, a dangerous Camorra criminal organization from Naples involved in the international drug trafficking of a large quantities of drug, drugs, mainly cocaine. This investigation Result, uh, resulted in the arrest of 11 people in January 2016. Subsequently, as a result of the proceeds of crime, in particular uh, uh, as the result of the uh, asset investigation, uh, Guadi Finance of Naples uh, established that part of the legal profits of this organization um, that part of the legal press, uh, of this organization uh, coming from the traffic of cocaine was, inv was invested in, uh, in uh, the purchase of an international black market of two important paintings by the famous Dutch painter Vincent Van Gogh, which were stolen, as I said, from the Van Gogh Museum in, Am in Amsterdam in December 2002. The investigation was a strengthened was strengthened by the statements given by another member of the organization, who was arrested by Guardia Finanza in January 2016. That member confirmed that uh, the paintings were in possession of one of the leaders of the criminal organization. There was the risk that these two paintings would have been immediately returned in a conspicuous amount of cash, which would have been imposed to trace. For this reason, we immediately decided on 25 September 2016 to recover the paintings and seize them. The paintings were hidden inside the wall in the house of the parents of the leader of the organization in Castellammare di Stabia, Naples. It was only a miracle, a miracle that the works were recovered, but it was a more, almost even more miraculous that they were found in reasonably good conditions. The paintings were considered to be among the most searched for the world on the FBI list for, uh, of the top 10 art crimes in the world. 
After the discovery and the recovery of the paintings, we immediately activated, activated very close collaboration with the Dutch authorities to obtain very quickly an expert opinion that confirmed that the way they were the authentic paintings. On the 30th September 2016, with a press conference that had international media interest, we announced the recovery of the two paintings. On, on the 19th January 2000, uh, 2017, in a very short uh, time frame, the trial was celebrated against the, this organization. The two members, uh, the two main members of uh, the association, who, who I have referred to above, were respectively sentenced to 18 and 14 years of imprisonment. With the sentence of the conviction, the funds to return the funds to return the works of art to the Dutch authorities also began. Before the paintings definitive return to the Netherlands, the paintings were exhibited, exhibited in Naples for three weeks. In the beautiful surroundings of the Museum of Capodimonte, to be viewed, uh, viewed by all visitors and a ball by young school children. These are hallowed all of us to communicate a very important message to all community. The message, the message is that thanks to a legality of jet, objects, in this case paintings, thanks to the, legal, the legality objects, in this case paintings, stolen by criminal organization, were returned to the community for the benefit of everyone. A winning and optimistic message in the daily ba battle that the judicial and police authorities systematically conduct against organized crime groups, uh, against organized uh, crime groups like Camorra and Mafia. Finally, on 27 February 2017, the two paintings returned to Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The seizure of the, these paintings has demonstrated once again the economic force of Camorra and or Mafia organization and their international connection. Now I'll show you a video clip of the most important moments of the Van Gogh case.
Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it.